he was terrified at how quickly it was moving. He feels he's let the genie out of the bottle. Uh, he had wanted a much slower, more measured reform, but no, it was spiraling out of control. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place for first-hand Cold War history accounts. And thanks to financial supporter Jack Veselak for providing today's intro. And make sure you hit that follow button in your podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. In August 1989, a group of Hungarian activists did the unthinkable. They entered the forbidden militarised zone of the Iron Curtain and held a picnic. Word had spread of what was going to happen. On wisps of rumour, thousands of East Germans had made their way to the border between Hungary and Austria, awaiting an opportunity, fearing prison and surveilled by lurking Stasi agents. The stage was set for the greatest border breach in Cold War history. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Union, the so-called end of history, all would flow from those dramatic hours. Drawing on dozens of original interviews with those involved, Matthew Longo's book, The Picnic, An Escape to Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain, reconstructs this world-shaping event and its tumultuous aftermath. You can buy the book through the links in the episode notes and help support the podcast. Or if you listen in the first week of publication, do check out our book giveaway, also in the episode notes. I'm delighted to welcome Matthew Longo to our Cold War conversation. Prologue. Laszlo gives me a tour of what is nowhere. How did the East Germans even find this place, he wonders aloud. It is Annas Mundi, he says, the asshole of the world. No one knew about this part of the borderlands. On maps, only the line was represented, but not the vast stretch of no-go zones that comprised the Iron Curtain, the militarised frontier that emerged after World War II, dividing Europe between East Soviet influence and the West American influence. If the full boundary system wasn't shown, the logic went, people wouldn't find it. Thus, the reality of the border was itself divided. For the military, the border regime was precise. For the average person, it was mysterious and threatening. Laszlo takes me to the edge of the woods. We follow the tree line down a slope through tall grass. When we round a bend, a clearing opens up. This is where the picnic is parked, he says. The field on which Laszlo and I are standing was the site of the pan-European picnic held on August the 19th, 1989 on the Austrian-Hungarian border, a giant open-air party celebrating European togetherness and freedom which furnished the stage for the greatest breach of the border in Cold War history. Hundreds of East German refugees dashing towards freedom the initial tug by which the entire Iron Curtain would unspool. Or as Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of the newly reunified Germany, would later put it, where the first stone was removed from the Berlin Wall. That's an excerpt from the prologue of Matthew Longo's book The Picnic, An Escape to Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain. I came at this as an oral history project. Um, in fact, when I first heard about the picnic, it's interesting. I don't, I don't come at this from a, a Cold War background. I'm not a Cold War historian. I actually come at this from an interest in borders. I'm a political scientist, and I've studied borders now for most of my career. And when you're in this slender border world, in a way, you think you've heard all the great stories, right? Like you think you've heard these amazing stories of of escape and capture, and you know, of heroism. And it's really, it's it's a it's a high drama field borders, as, as anyone who follows contemporary politics recognizes. But when I heard this story, I was blown away that I hadn't heard it before. And the reason I pursued it is in part because I knew the people, the actors involved were, were mostly living. And therefore, the kind of book I could write uh, wouldn't be a history in the, in the, just in the blow-by-blow blow sense, but something quite different, right? Born of these unique uh, personal histories. So in a way, that was the origin story of everything. I don't think I would have pursued it had I not thought I could do that kind of oral project. And those are just the sort of stories we love on Cold War Conversations. So uh, you've got the right audience here. Um, 
where I'd like to start is if you could give me a brief description of the political situation in Hungary in 88 and 89. So it's a little bit difficult, certainly for lay audiences, maybe people who've read about the, about the Cold War, even lived through parts of the Cold War, uh, to understand Hungary, because Hungary was quite exceptional in the sense that it didn't fit the normal or natural binary between a free liberal West and a somewhat clamped down unfree Soviet bloc or communist bloc. Because Hungary was, was a, by 88, certainly, but had been for a while a bit of a, um, of a bit of a hybrid in the sense that there were already economic reforms, there were already political reforms, and it was seen, certainly in the East, as something of a socialist uh, paradise, where there was good food, there was wine, the weather was nice, which is nothing about the economy, but helped the tourism. And, uh, but people felt as though they could be themselves. People were already speaking in this way in the, in the, in the mid eighties, early eighties, that hunger was a place you could go to be yourself. And then you'd go back to the, the GDR, you'd go back to Bulgaria or somewhere and you'd feel more clamped down. And so Hungary to start, uh, for those who don't know Hungary in particular, uh, you have to sort of get out of the classic Cold War uh, mindset. And so what uh, Hungary looked like in the late 80s, it was a place of reform, and specifically with the rise of Miklos Nemeth, which is the, the prime minister whose uh, life story I largely track in the book. He was the last communist prime minister of Hungary. Uh, he came into power in, in the very fall, November, December of 88, and uh, had a very clear reform project, which is that he wanted Hungary to pursue a multi-party democratic path. Now, for as much as Hungary was already a socialist pasture, right? it was already this place that was a beautiful place to live, that was an incredibly radical kind of reform. And it was a kind of reform that, as he would later um, say directly to Gorbachev, um, which I recount in the book, uh, would require the communists to accept that there could be elections that they could lose, and if they lost, they'd have to leave. Right? This is really he really had a very strong democratic vision, and so this is the person uh, at the top, and that's not quite true, right? Because the 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 fact that your prime minister says nothing about your power in the party and so forth. I mean, there are, there are many different versions of power which we can get into, but at the very least, it says something that uh, there is such a strong movement of reform uh, within the halls of power, also. Um, yeah, uh, we should also mention Imre Pozsgai, who was the um, Minister of State alongside Nemeth, another reformer. These are two very, very influential figures of this era, the late '88, early '89. Uh, 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 so, where, whereas uh, Nemeth was doing things in the um, formal legal sense, the biggest thing that Pozsgai did, or the most important thing that Pozsgai did, he actually did in an informal sense, mostly through the radio channels, and particular talking about 1956 and forcing the Hungarian public to rethink what 56 meant. 56 or 1956 was when the Hungarians rose up against Soviet occupation and were defeated by a subsequent Soviet invasion. In, in particular, that, I mean, we now often think of 56 in heroic terms, right? The idea that these were freedom fighters, street fighters, um, who were fighting against what was uh, a pretty draconian kind of rule. Um, from the you know the Soviet puppets in charge in Budapest, and, but at the time that was not spoken about, right? Because of course the people in power were those people, right? Who were the ones suppressing the um, student and popular, but mostly student, at least in the or in the outset, um, revolt. And uh, so you have Nemeth and Pozsgai at the top, and then you also have already in '88 all of these movements. They're not parties. They cannot run for office. There is no multi-party democracy, so obviously they can't run for office. Uh, but they're already acting like parties. They're mobilizing large quantities of people. And in the book, I, I follow mostly the MDF, the Hungarian Democratic Forum. But there were lots. I mean, I guess uh, most famously, we now uh, know because of the rise of Orban, uh, Fides. Uh, anyways, so, th so to, to, if, the, if the question is about stage setting, that's the way I would I would capture what it felt like. It felt like there was some uncertainty about the power at the top, where some reform was possible. No one knew exactly what that meant. It wasn't like it was communicated. This was, in fact, true around the East since Gorbachev's rise, but it was especially true in Hungary. And you have already popular mobilization, um, even if not 
totally formal, right? <laughs> like halfway between formal and informal, let's say. And that came to a head in March 89, right? So the, 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 the address of Push Guy was the winter, it was January, February. And in March, you had big popular rallies in Budapest. And so at both levels, both the street level and the governmental level, you're feeling real change. But of course, always the story with change in any kind of autocratic state of any sort, even a relatively liberal one, is always the question of how far is too far? Where's the line? When do you find out if you've crossed it? And so that's, that's the feeling of those late 88, early 89 months of, of, of opposition groups trying to figure out where that line is. I have heard Hungary described as the happiest barracks in the bloc. It was um, probably the most relaxed of the Eastern Bloc countries. But but with uh, Nemeth, he's got this rivalry with the party leader, um, Gross, and he's he's almost been set up to fail here. He's almost been set up to be a fall guy because they're in a quite bad financial straits, as is most of the Eastern Bloc as well. And I think it's also worth mentioning that there's Poland going on in the background where solidarity has been legalized again and is about to enter into semi-free elections with the communist government as well. So that there's a there's the a number of well there's these two countries almost in flux simultaneously. Yeah, exactly. And I will say one thing about Poland, which is that I I talk very little about Poland in the book. I mean, it comes out here and there. I mean, you have to. It's the other reform state. A lot of the challenges that Hungary was facing, Poland was facing, not just vis-a-vis -vis Gorbachev and the Soviet Union, but also, in particular, different scenes with Ceausescu and Romania and so forth. Uh, but I talk very little about Poland, in part because I didn't mean this to be a corrective book. I really just wanted to tell the story of the picnic and this incredible moment in the fields outside Chopin. But it felt like when I started to do all this reading about 89, I mean, there's so much work about Poland. And I felt that when I looked for work on Hungary, there was very little. And so in a way, this was, it became something of a, of a mission of mine to correct that narrative, to say that there's actually, there were these two <laughs> pictures of reform. The one gets so much press and the one gets very little press. Um, but no, of course, I don't mean to diminish anything about the importance of, of Poland. In fact, the Polish roundtable and the Polish um, elections, all of these were, were motivating factors. If anything, there was a, there was a feedback loop right between um, the reform movements in Hungary and the reform movements in Poland, both clearly aware of what the others were doing and feeding off their gains. What is Gorbachev's view of what's going on in, in Hungary? How, how does he feel about reforms and, and, and changes there? So Gorbachev is, is, I mean, this is a general statement about Gorbachev, but Gorbachev is, is certainly with the vantage of hindsight, uh, walking a very precarious line, right? So it's a very liminal position, Gorbachev's position, in the sense that he wants reform, but he wants reform off of the norm as it was set and understood in the Soviet Union. He actually doesn't want reform in the sense that Nemeth wanted it, right? There was quite a difference in their vision in the sense that uh, Nemeth really wanted a post-communist future. And this is something Gorbachev didn't want. He wanted a reformed communist future. He wanted to go back to communism uh, of Lenin and the idea of a, of a functioning uh, communist state in which one can have development and, and degrees of political freedom without having uh, the liberalism of the West or democratic elections in the free sense. And his, the cleave with Nemeth then is quite uh, considerable in the sense that uh, Gorbachev was worried, in fact, in, in hindsight, Gorbachev was correct to be worried, that all the things that Nemeth had in mind would end up being a death spiral for the whole communist system, that it couldn't sustain, that reform in the Nemeth sense would be revolutionary. And that was not at all what, what uh, Gorbachev wanted. What I found, part of the interesting bit of the research of the book, aside from obviously learning more about Gorbachev than I'd ever known, um, was specifically in, in threading the difference of these visions. You know, in general, uh, until you get into the details, political visions often sound very similar. 
right? It's very easy to put Nemeth and Gorbachev in the same camp. And I think that's true in any kind of political context with which one is only mildly familiar. As I said, I have to stress on a podcast like this, I'm not a cold horror historian, right? This is not, I came at this as someone uh, with a different interest, but of course, I've since, you know, now spent years obsessively reading on this particular subject. I now care deeply. But on the outside, Nemeth and Gorbachev looked the same to me, right? They didn't have a way of differentiating them. And one of the interesting things is, of course, when you start to talk to these people, I, of course, I didn't get to talk to Gorbachev, I should stress, but Dr. Nemeth, uh, for him, it was crystal clear the difference in their visions. And I find that interesting um, as, a, as a person learning about this story, because once that became clear, and once 89 happened and communism fell apart, you start to commiserate more with some of the forecasts Gorbachev had put out. In a way, Gorbachev was really correct in his concerns about Nemeth, um, just as Nemeth was correct in his uh, hope for Hungary, so to speak. I mean, that, we can talk about that later. But um, yeah, but there's obviously a difference of vision. So Nemeth is, is sort of grappling with the financial situation that Hungary is in, and he is obviously looking down the uh, budgets and he uh, comes across some, presumably some line items regarding the cost of maintaining the border between Hungary and Austria, the Iron Curtain. Yeah, precisely. So there's a couple of things to say about that. So Nemeth was a trained economist, right? So his training in, in Hungary was at Karl Marx University. This was a, he rose to the top flights of the Hungarian state entirely on his record as an economist. Uh, this was not the, in a way, it was, it was like, you know, you, you think about the worst versions of the apparatchik story and the way bureaucracy works. This is the best way a bureaucracy could work, that the brightest minds of, the, of, of an economics end up trying to reform the economy of the state. But consequently, he had, uh, at this point, years and years of experience looking not just at the problems of the economy in Hungary, in particular issues of debt, uh, but also the way that the state was cooking the books, right? I mean, there was, a, there was uh, explicit illegality and, and dishonesty from the state. And uh, he settled on the idea that the way forward would be to have sovereign borders. And uh, there are two sides of that story. The one side is a simple trade story. You can't sustain an economy if you can't control the value of the things you're either trading in or trading. You have no control over that, which they didn't. But the other side, and this is what you're hitting on, uh, is, is, is about the actual border, not the border in the abstract sense where one sovereignty ends and another begins, but in the physical sense. The Iron Curtain was this incredibly expensive uh, um, terrain. We're talking about kilometers wide, uh, heavily armed zone. Um, in the 50s, it included landmines. At this point, the president was mostly electrical wire and and soldiers and dogs and watchtowers and so, so forth. But in particular, maintaining the electricity was so expensive that uh, Nemeth had a brilliant insight, which is that the first aim about sovereignty would be really hard to try to convince anyone of. I mean, Hunger wasn't just going to declare its sovereignty against you know, Soviet wishes. But the second claim, this comparatively at least seemingly small claim, about the funding of a border wire, right? This seems like a manageable issue, was something he felt uh, Gorbachev would understand and that he could communicate. And so when he met Gorbachev in March of 89, he took this secondary proposal, but he saw that the secondary proposal was the ticket towards the first one. He couldn't say the first one, right? But that was the strategy. Start with the second, start with the seeming issue, that frankly, anybody could understand, right? The electric wire was too expensive. Hungary was in debt. They said, uh, hung, Nemeth's position was rather simple. It wasn't even get rid of it. It was, if you want it, you pay for it. To which Gorbachev said, look, your board is your problem. And that was that. Within a month, they started rolling up the wiring because the wires, um, even if it seems, again, it seems like a small issue, were, were costly. Why were they costly? Because they had become so frayed they went off all the time. They no longer effectively predicted human passage into the borderlands. And you had essentially a borderlands uh, with border guards constantly going out to check 
what the wires were, were all, all the different uh, alarms and alerts produced by the electrical wiring systems that were mostly dead animals. And it was, it was too, it was too costly and also dangerous for border guards to be doing this. And so he takes us to Gorbachev and Gorbachev says, okay, you do it yourself. He immediately starts unrolling it. But what, the reason it was a brilliant strategy is that Nemeth understood in an incredibly clear minded way. Once you start dismantling the Iron Curtain, the pathway towards the sovereign end he sought, uh, in a way, becomes visible, let's say, even if it's still distant. And when I think back at Nemeth, Nemeth was a, or is a, he's still living, um, a brilliant political strategist. Nemeth saw something that uh, I feel yeah, very privileged to have learned because I really feel um, edified by it. Yeah, I love the fact that he decides to turn off the electric fence the day after May Day. So I'm presuming he's expecting all good communists to be nursing massive hangovers at that point. And um, he has a uh, press conference uh, to uh, announce this. And he's he's still sort of somewhat concerned because he's worried that Gorbachev may be overthrown by hardliners at some point. At some point, as well, isn't he? He's concerned about other rea- Soviet reactions to this. Yeah, Nemeth is terrified. He's done something shocking. I mean, starting to unroll the electric fencing of the Iron Curtain is a shocking use of political power for a prime minister in 1989 Soviet bloc. And he's scared from both ends. He's scared internally that there will be an attempted coup or an attempted assassination. That the party will say this is this man is a liability. Let's get him out. Uh, that would come from Gross or someone else when, amongst the party hardliners. That's the one side. That's the internal fear, and the external fear is that all that goodwill he had with Gorbachev, all this kind of tolerance that Gorbachev showed towards this incredible, provocative end, uh, would end up uh, leading to Gorbachev's ouster. What happens if Gorbachev gets removed by someone? Uh, uh, stronger, so more hardline behind him. The first thing that would happen, Nemeth felt, and I think totally reasonably, is they would make a show of the kind of person like a Nemeth in Hungary. And uh, Nemeth was terrified. This was this was in fact when you talk to him now, he talks about all the different things that happened in eighty nine. There was a lot of moments like this, but that feeling of uncertainty between those two poles. Right, R R was crushing to him. It was a crushing fear. These moves towards further reform are sort of pushed further forward with a ceremony on June the sixteenth, eighty nine, when Imre Nagy is reburied, who was the leader of the Hungarian government during the nineteen fifty six uprising. And what 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 is the the reaction of the hardliners in the Hungarian Communist Party to the fact that he's being sort of um, exonerated for you know what what happened in fifty six. Yeah, so this is this parallel track, right? So the, on the formal track, you have Nemeth talking to Gorbachev, dealing with Gross, and then there's this informal track where there's a connector. Between the regime, the, the the government, which is which is led by Nemeth, and the, and the opposition groups, the bridge between them was this man named Imre Pushkai. Now, Pushkai was the one who was very uh, uh, active in changing the narrative around fifty six. This this whole uh, possibility, this was something that was impossible to talk about from fifty six up until eighty eight. So much so that, in fact, eighty eight. Uh, when they tried to do the exact thing they would do in 89, they tried to have a reburial of Natch's, Natch's body, uh, everyone was dispersed by police with batons beating them. Right? So the story of uh, like the, the, the turnaround really is um, it's, it's like whiplash inducing, right? I mean, 56 to 88, in a way, all those years are the same on this story, right? There is no discussion in Hungary, it is explicitly disallowed to talk about what 56 meant and the legacy of the violence against Hungarian citizens meted out by the government. And then starting in 89, already with Pozsgai's radio address, and then carrying through in March 
in the protest when, when very provocatively, um, a, a quite famous poem from the um, uh, 1950 that was banned in 56 was read aloud by a student in a march in Budapest. And now up to June, I mean, it really is, uh, this is the aspect of the account that is blow by blow, right? I mean, it is a month by month um, story. On June 16th, you have the culmination of that line, right? Not the formal line that Nemeth and Gorbachev are dealing with, this informal line we're talking about radio addresses and poetry and, and, and opposition and so forth, uh, with the reburial in Menachem's body. And we're talking about a reburial in the full sense, his body was exhumed and celebrated in being buried, not in an unmarked grave, but in a marked one that was allowed to have, um, would it be recognized as such. And it is at this day that, aside from all the obvious symbolism and the power symbolically of what's happening, uh, that we also have the introduction to the political scene of the person who would now become uh, the most important person in Hungarian politics, and certainly the most recognizable name um, to most of your listeners, which is Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban gave a speech in which he said something that, again, at the time was unimaginable. Even two months earlier was unimaginable. Certainly pre-March was unimaginable in 89, which is to the explicitly state, um, Soviets get out. But it was an incredibly powerful moment in Hungary. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people in the past. We're talking a new leadership forming and becoming present. And uh, in particular, people being able to say things out loud that for you know, the 30 plus years since the massacre of 56 would never, ever, ever, ever have been said out loud. The, the momentum sort of continues because in 27th of June, there's a meeting with the Austrian foreign minister and his Hungarian counterpart who symbolically cut the border fence, highlighting the decision to dismantle border surveillance. Yeah, it's a great moment. So uh, we talk now, if we zoom to the present, that we're kind of obsessed with data or big data and the, the world of technology. And how everything is is fake now because everything is all about uh, the visual, it's the optics, and certainly with AI, there's this fear that everything becomes fake: photographs and video, etc. One of the nice things about reading history is you realize that this, was, of course, was always true. Right? It was always true that politics was about optics and imagery, and a lot of the things we we, we think of as as real or, or solid were always um, politically manipulated. June 27th is a brilliant example of this because you have these two foreign ministers, uh, Horn, who will become very important later in Hungary, and Mach in Austria, holding a comically sized pair of scissors uh, in front of the electric wiring. It's a big moment as they bilaterally cut the electric fencing. Even the, the, the assumption behind the image is preposterous because, of course, it wasn't a bilateral decision at all. Austria had no role in this. Um, but the optics, of course, are great. It looks bilateral. There's the East and the West, sure. But the part that's phenomenal about it, on a purely, um, the pure cynical view of politics sense, is that they actually had to, because so much wiring had been already taken down, they had to put wiring back up for the photograph. So what you're seeing is two men purporting to cut a wire bilaterally, when in fact the wire had already been cut. It was rebuilt for them to cut it ceremonially in a decision that was never bilateral. The whole thing is farcical, but such is politics. And it was an incredibly effective, powerful image, right? Of this, of the, again, this gets back to what I consider to be the brilliant of Nemeth's insight, which is once you start dismantling the Iron Curtain, you're going to set in motion something that's going to be very difficult to stop. And that image on June 27th is an exemplar of that feeling. The other nations of the Warsaw Pact can see that as well. They can see that this is dangerous. And by coincidence, there's a Warsaw Pact meeting on July the 6th, uh, where they all to get, get together in, in Bucharest. And one of the th many surprising details, which I didn't know in the book, was your, the, the detail that uh, Nemeth and the uh, Hungarian government's delegation ended up sleeping outside in the garden of their residence. Can you just tell us about that? Yeah, so it's already, uh, so the scene, I mean, I think we've um, said it already in this conversation, it's obviously a tense moment. Um, 
the part that I want to want to highlight here is it really brings up how radical what Nemeth was doing, because whereas any country can itself reform, but most of the time the reform that's happening within a country is limited within that country's borders. But when you start to attack what is essentially a shared border, the Iron Curtain is something all the states of the East in a way depended on, the closedness created by it, you're not affecting only your own country, you're affecting everyone. And uh, the, the feeling that what Nemeth was doing in this case was threatening the very ground on which all these states essentially, um, all these leaders walked, uh, was, was prevalent in the room. Now, to set the stage, Ceausescu, who throughout the book is a bit of the, the anti-hero, the aggressor, that's not a, um, uh, a crazy comma general for anyone that knows anything about the Cold War. I mean, Ceausescu was also, frankly, a maniac. But uh, in this particular story, because of the particular relationship between Romania and Hungary, and of course all the Hungarians living in Transylvania, uh, Ceausescu has a particular villainous role. So the fact that it's the last Warsaw Pact is serendipitous. The fact that it's in Romania uh, is in a way, uh, if you'd seen it in a Hollywood movie, you wouldn't believe it. Like, it's too perfect. And of course, it could have been anywhere, right? It had to be in here, in the place where there's already been a year of antagonism between Romania um, and uh, uh, Hungary, where the Romanian-Hungarian border is already being remilitarized by Ceausescu in June. There's rumors of a war between the two states. There have been assassination attempts, or at least the rumors of assassination attempts, um, by the Romanian government against uh, people like Nemeth. So the tension is, is already intense. And then you have this moment where the Warsaw Pact, which as we now know is literally dying, this would be their last meeting, uh, it comes to Ceausescu's house, so to speak. And Nemeth is... Uh, persona non grata in a way, and shows up at a, um, the villa given to his delegation and finds that, uh, because of course he doesn't go in first, right? He's the, the prime minister. He sends in a team of people to check the room, um, obviously for things like bugs, something quite banal in the Soviet era, but in particular, they have a machine to determine uh, radioactivity. We're not talking about radioactivity in the sense there'd be a bomb, like something would blow up. It's actually just that there's a level of exposure that sustained um, time in such a place would, would, would be ultimately fatal. And they find out that the amount of, of, uh, of radioactivity is so high that Nimeth isn't even allowed into, into the premises. So fortunately, it's July, it's a balmy summer night, and he and the whole team sleep outside. But that gives you a sense of what we're talking about. This is not a, this is not a meeting of people who are a little bit upset with the course of reform. This is not a genteel difference about vision, right? This is a, a murderous difference of opinion. Um, and uh, it really shows the true colors of um, the regime in, in Romania. Absolutely. Absolutely. And unsurprisingly, at this meeting, Nemes is verbally beaten up by the whole cabal, really, aside from Gorbachev. Gorbachev appears to be just sitting there watching. And at one point, you describe Nemes looking for support from Gorbachev, and he glances over, and Gorbachev just gives him a wink, which I just thought was a lovely, lovely image. Yeah, it's such a beautiful way of understanding how politics works, that in a room uh, was so given the climate of essential, you know, of murderous intent, where Ceausescu is 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 hectoring, he's yelling, he's stamping, he's banging the table. There's all this big ticket violence. I mean, this kind of a high drama, and yet the real power is something so incredibly subtle. This little powerful gesture where Nemeth is we really, you know, Nemeth is concerned he's not going to come out of the room alive, and that's not, uh, you know, that's not overstatement. I mean, he. He might not have made it out of the hotel room alive, right? This is not a, a um, some kind of writerly flourish to make it seem more dramatic than it was. This is clearly a uh, a scary situation. I mean, also we should add that Nemeth is the youngest person in the room. He's really green in political sense. A lot of these these people knew each other for decades. This is not, um, and uh, 
he's really, you know, honestly terrified, and he's not sure where he stands, except that he believes, right? He believes, he has no evidence, but he believes that if things really got worse, Gorbachev would protect him. And so he looks to Gorbachev for any sign, knowing there isn't going to be some grand declaration of support or anything like that. And Gorbachev just gives him this tiny little subtle flick of the eye as a gesture to say, look, I hear you. I understand what you're going through. You'll be okay. And it's such a profoundly moving uh, moment in what's otherwise a really terrifying, you know, profoundly unmoving um, scene. I will say one more thing about it. Oh, the, my favorite anecdote from all of this uh, is the, not just the hectoring and the yelling. Of course, we know what Ceausescu is saying. Uh, but there's one little bit about how he says it, which is that he refuses uh, to call Nemeth comrade and refers to him as Mr. Mr. Nemeth. In this, in that sense, incredibly patronizing way, uh, but it also cleaves clearly um, the difference between what was happening in Hungary and Poland, as someone like Ceausescu would have thought, because uh, in Poland, the kinds of reforms happening in Poland could have uh, galvanized an opposition in Romania, but they themselves would not have changed the state of power in Romania, the state of the economy in Romania. And uh, the Polish delegation referred to as comrades. What Nemeth was doing was so different, right? It's really a different thing when you start to open what is essentially a shared border in one territory. It gives you a sense of how much, uh, I can say easily that it's so powerful and important, but it really distills how much Ceausescu saw, that this was an existential threat. It was a reform that was different than other kinds of reforms. And I think that's really clarifying. Probably one of the countries that's got the most to lose if the borders opened is East Germany, because Hungary is an immensely popular holiday destination for East Germans. With Lake Balaton, it's an opportunity for them to meet their West German relatives in a relatively you know, relaxed country from a security point of view, although the Stasi does have its own office in Hungary and he's monitoring this closely. So, you know, th this opening of the border could and will destabilize East Germany. So the situation at, at this point, there's loads of East Germans on holiday in Hungary and they start to hear about plans for a picnic on the border. Now how does this idea of this pan-European picnic originate? June 20th is the start date. We're talking in Debrecen now. Debrecen is all the way east in Hungary. Uh, that's an important detail because the Iron Curtain, of course, by definition, is the far west of Hungary. But this is also one of those uh, place-setting, time-setting moments in a conversation because you have to understand that, that we're... we're we're a short drive away at this point uh, from what is now Ukraine, right? But then was literally the Soviet Union. It was the site of the largest Soviet base in the whole country, right? This, this was the hub. Uh, I think I, I, I at one point knew the exact drive time to the Soviet Union, but you know, it's an hour, under an hour, whatever it is. It's on the border. And Debrecen is, it's also on the Romanian border, I should add. Um, and Debrecen is not anywhere near the, the capital. It's also not anywhere near where any of the historical power or money ever was in Hungary. In Hungary, the country really is bifurcated with Budapest in the center, where everything west of Budapest uh, was showered with the wealth of the ages of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Habsburgs and so forth. And the moment you go east of Budapest, you essentially go east. You really are uh, outside of even central Europe. You're in the a place that feels more discreetly connected to um, Ukraine and Romania and so forth. And it's outside of the wealth and power. It's also outside of, then, information. Because whereas now anybody anywhere has access to information everywhere, uh, you really have to imagine, if you're trying to understand this story, especially when we're no longer talking in the big geopolitical sense, uh, the big power sense, that everyone we're talking out in Debrecen didn't know anything. 
They had no information about change, no information about all these different things. The only information they had came from the fact that if you were a young person and were interested at all in politics, you might have joined one of these party, not parties, right? These non political party organizations that would, of course, soon become parties. So there was this kind of information desert. The reason that's important is it's so powerful when events happen in such a context, because events become information sources. And in this case, on June 20th, what happened is a politician, important European politician in his own right, Otto von Habsburg, uh, but specifically in the Hungarian sense, because this is what would have been the heir right, of the Habsburg Empire, the Auto- Austro-Hungarian Empire, had it not folded. And, uh, importantly, Habsburg spoke Hungarian, which for a European politician is unheard of. Right? This, is a, this is a man that grew up in an old Europe in which Austria and Hungary were already linked. And he comes all the way to Debrecen in a way that most European politicians wouldn't, to speak to Hungarians about his vision of a relatively borderless Europe, of European togetherness. Uh, and he finds, first of all, a packed room of students desperate to hear these things. Right? I mean, you can imagine how a hungry student would be like, desperate to hear this kind of, in, in a way that we, we don't have equivalents these days. There's no equivalent of the amount of power a person giving a speech in a place like Debrecen would have had. And a select group of people, um, amongst them, this is, these are people that came from um, the people who organized that von Habsburg would come, particularly Lukács Szabó, and organized a small gathering in the evening where the people got together. One of them was Ferenc Mesarosh, who's the main, in a way, the main character of the story. That's not quite true. I don't think there is a main character, so to speak, but in a way, because he's the originator of the, ide- originator of the idea of the picnic, he's something like the main character of the story. Mesarosh is there, listening to all these people talk about freedom and free expression and these exciting ideas, which in Hungary are already shocking, but in Debnitsen are doubly shocking. And at one point, they start talking about reforms of the Iron Curtain and the, and the border. And Mesarosh has this idea that says, you know, it's fine to be doing this in a room with this fancy heir to a once great empire uh, over, you know, a fancy dinner. But if we're serious, that doesn't do anything. If we're serious, we have to go to the border. If you want to change the border, you go to the border. And he had this idea, uh, which even now sounds slightly wine-soaked. I'm sure everyone was having a good time at this part of the evening. Why don't we throw a party? Let's throw a party at the border. Even saying it, and I've said it now, for the, this is five years I've been researching this book, even saying it again five years in for the 5,000th time, it still sounds ridiculous that you would think, I know how I'm going to bring down the Iron Curtain. Let's get beer and, you know, sausage and throw a party. But this was his idea. And it was, in fact, completely brilliant. It was completely brilliant in much the same way as Nemeth's insight was brilliant, which is sure, the party is not going to change the world, but the party might normalize the idea that the Iron Curtain was no longer a beast as it had been imagined. It would change the image of this institution in a way that could change the world. And uh, you know, so it's easy to dismiss it because in a way it's dismissible. It's absurd. It's completely absurd. In fact, Fedens had come out of the theater, and his love was absurdist theater. The whole idea for him was absurd. Its point was to be absurd. Anyways, he gets basically laughed out of the room. And uh, a week later, there's a meeting of the MDF in what I think is still maybe the, one, of, one of the most moving moments in the story. When he comes up, at this point, he's kind of, he can't let go of the idea. He brings it to this party. and. It takes a lot of confidence to to bring it to the party, you know, soberly in the light of day, this this idea. And he basically gets laughed out again. And uh, it would have died. It would have died th- then and there because it was over. It was absurd. He tried and it was laughed at. The party basically told him, look, we're a real party. We're trying to be a real thing. Don't waste our time with your juvenile ideas. And yet he found a a partner, which is this woman named Maria Philip. And she says, look, I'll help you plan it. 
let's do this. And it's really a quite wonderful thing that they had the two of them together, not just against all odds and against lack of information and money and all the danger inherent in the border, but also against the mockery of your peers, which to me is the more moving part of the story, which is that it's not just that it was an impossible dream and in some ways an idiotic dream, right? I mean, they had no money. What were they going to do? How are they going to do it? Organize a party uh, 400 you know, kilometers away. You couldn't do that easily now, right? It's like if you had no money in the middle of the UK, you're not throwing a party 400 kilometers away. That's insane. Um, but I find the point about ridicule the more profound one, which is that it takes a certain kind of person to be not just not just face the odds of a state that might kill you or imprison you or something, uh, but face down your peers, your your putative revolutionary friends. Um, and go and basically alone, and I find that really moving, even still. You know, th- th- this sort of highlights the amazing cast of characters you have in this story, and and this is what brings it alive because you you go into a lot of detail about their experiences, and you you, you talk about you know the you know how Maria manages to get through on the phone to people who she would not have no right to normally speak to. She's this phenomenal um, character who who manages to, you know, organise this and 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 get it get it all together. And and amongst those other characters, I just want to highlight a couple of characters that that you've got in there. I think, you know, you talked about that being really moving. I think one of the stories that I found really moving was the story of Katia and Oscar, who had. Met, I think they were 17 and they met on separate school trips to the Soviet Union. Katia's from East Germany, Oscar's from West Germany. And the only way that they can get together is, is, is to, uh, meet, meet in Hungary. Um, and it, that, that's an amazing story. You've got the, the, the various different East German families who are involved, their stories about how they, get across the border how they arrive there and there's a lot of twists and turns in in those stories as well and you've also got one of our guests involved in this as well laszlo Nage from episode 52 where we described his uh his life in in hungary which reminded me that i do have a further section of his interview which i haven't yet published so uh do watch out for that but if if we move towards the the actual picnic itself and how that unfolds yeah of course i mean the truth is is that once the idea is hatched it's only about 6 weeks of planning before you start to get to the picnic and you have at this point already because of nemeth's reforms the iron curtain remember you know, the way we're talking i mean these two strains of narrative are actually contemporaneous right so uh, the border cutting of 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 mock um uh, and horn is Roughly contemporaneous with the uh, idea for Mesarosh, the meeting in uh, Ceausescu's Romania of Nemeth is roughly contemporaneous with Maria uh, opting in. I mean, they're all happening at the same time, and it then starts to move very quickly after everything moving very slowly in July and August in the planning, especially once they team up with um, Laszlo Magash and go to Chopra, because then you're literally at the border. But the reason it's important to highlight the contemporaneousness of these events is it means that already after the beginning of the rolling up of the electrical wire, people in East Germany start to understand what's happening, which is that, again, these optics, these these ideas that are unimaginable until roughly May 89, uh, start to spark ideas around, you know, not just East Germany, around the whole Eastern Bloc, but especially East Germany. As you said, East Germany uh, certainly had the most to lose. Uh, by opening up the uh, Iron Curtain, you, you know the the most obvious example of this comes from the Berlin Wall, right? What was the Berlin Wall designed to do? It was designed to keep East Germans in, and uh, they were relatively effective. The Berlin, you know, we love to say that walls don't work, but of course walls can work, and in Berlin it really did. The fact that it took a whole Stasi apparatus to make it work. I mean, there's there's reasons we can talk about the comparison, but the point being that. The, the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain, and it says in this sense the inter-German border, were an effective tool for their purpose in 
this period from 61 until 88. And the pressure valve off that system was that while these Germans could not go to West Germany and they could not go to the West, they could at least go to places within the socialist East that were still desirable, places like Hungary, like Lake Balaton, and so forth. But of course, the only reason that works is because there's an iron curtain. And so the whole Berlin Wall structure is essentially built on the foundation of the Iron Curtain. The foundation being that East Germans could go to a place like Hungary where they also could not leave. The moment this starts to become shaky as a foundation in May, you have basically East Germans around East Germany looking at each other and saying, maybe this is our chance. Applying for visas to Hungary, planning trips to Hungary, which was anyways normal, nothing was going to raise flags. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these Germans anyways traveled to Hungary as tourists every summer. And hey, it was summer, right? It was June and July. And uh, obviously the narrative, because this is a, mostly a narrative history, is following uh, a set of families, mostly families, also uh, solo travelers, but mostly families, from the hearing of the news in Hungary from May, through the hiding of the plans in June, and ultimately through getting in the car in July and August, going down to Lake Balaton or Budapest or wherever, and then within Hungary, started to make their way to the border. Because importantly, as of August 1st, the uh, tent areas, the campsite areas outside um, of the uh, capital and towards the borderlands were also open to East Germans. They'd always been closed. So the actual action of the story doesn't take place near Lake Balaton at all, at all but instead near a place called Fertorakos which is this little Hungarian town on the Nuzadlose, which is this uh, other kind of lake that dips between Hungary and Austria. And the campsites there, which are now open to East Germans and suddenly filled with East Germans. Because while the picnickers are planning their party, which still, even though specifications have changed, involves uh, setting up a band from, you know, uh, a bandstand having, you know, sausage and goulash and, and beer, Contemporaneous with this moment where they're organizing a party in the defunct lands, the just rolled up, de-electrified lands of the Iron Curtain, now you have kilometers away, really, really close, thousands and thousands and thousands of East Germans waiting for the opportunity to get, for, to get to freedom. And as part of this picnic, there's going to be a symbolic opening of a border gate that's been closed for, you know, 30, 40 years. Right. So to go back to the, the incredibly charming, I still find, vision of the picnic from Mesarosh in June, the original idea of the picnic was there would be a border that's like a comic book version of a border where there's like a line and a fence and you can just wave to Austrians on the other side of the fence and you can kind of pass them sausages and that's the party. It was literally going to be Hungary, Hungarians on one side and Austrians on the other. Obviously that can't work. But of course, you know, the Iron Curtain is kilometers wide. I mean, it's, it's insane to think that. That would be a person who, of course, didn't have information, which, of course, makes sense of what we've been saying. But through Maria's phone calls and her uh, essentially manipulating the, the border guards to, to her whim, is able to, is able to work it out. They get a permit, not just for the place of the party, but also for a one-time-only border crossing of this little road that literally had been closed. It's, in, it's for four decades since the Iron Curtain became, right? So this is a, uh, an a unused road. It's actually not even a road. It's kind of like a dirt path. But it had a fence, and it was guarded, and it had a fence that had never been opened. Uh, they decided they would allow, because remember, Austrians or people from the West could come to East, right? It's just that East couldn't go West. Uh, so Austrians could easily come to Hungary, provided there were visas and paperwork, and this is all the stuff Maria is organizing for this, this insane window of time. Lots of phone calls, lots of letters, basically paperwork, so that a delegation, that was the word they used, of Austrians would come across this border, would open this border uh, for the picnic. But what that required was it required breaking this enormous, powerful lock, which had closed the gate for four decades, and replacing it with a tiny little one that was there for show. This little gold thing that they were going to open ceremoniously, it was going to be this big Look, it was going to be the same photo optic in a way as what happened on June 27th. Another one of these examples of, look, Hungarians and Austrians coming together. Look, we're just going to open this gate. But of course, what happened? 
is this, again, again in, the, in the profound ironies and flips and turns of the book, of the story, uh, the gate would end up becoming challenged. It would begin to becoming the, the source of the escape. And part of the reason it was so easy to push through was because of the tiny little lock they had found. So the old lock, which might have actually been able to stop people from crossing, that had been gotten rid of for the sake of Austrians going uh, east, suddenly became the, uh, the tool that enabled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of East Germans heading west. Yeah, so uh, 600 or so East Germans managed to hustle their way through that gate and cross over the, the border that day. But in following days, the border is, is closed again. This isn't the actual opening. It, it is a symbolic moment, and, and the border is, is, is closed. Yeah, exactly. So the, the interesting moral decision that the border guards make to basically not put up any resistance to these Germans, to let them pass, is part of the, the drama of the story, right? The fact that you have, it's fine to say there's a party and there's going to be 20,000 people celebrating nearby. It's fine to say there's all these thousands of refugees and families in these campsites, but ultimately whether they get through and whether they get through bloodlessly comes down to some decisions and the decisions of border guards uh, to not even try, not to shoot in the air, not to tell them to stop, to basically step aside and let them through. And uh, that's kind of a exciting, euphoric moment, but it really is a one-off. I mean, it happened. So we're talking about about 600 or 700 people crossing at that instant, um, about 3 o'clock on August 19th, through this particular gate. But then the gate was closed. But throughout the night, uh, all around the borderlands, people already had been trying and getting through. Um, but then after the 19th, specifically the 20th and 21st and 22nd of August, the evenings are filled with just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of East Germans pushing their way through, um, trying to cross, stepping through different layers of barbed wire, trying to avoid capture and so forth. And this proceeds uh, more or less unabated for weeks, right? You have this, this, this movement of people going into the borderlands. It comes to a head on the 21st in the evening with, when, when a refugee uh, is killed. Uh, it is taken to be an accident. I have no insight into whether or not it was an accident. I, I, I can't comment on that, but we generally accept it to be an accident. Sounded like there was unclarity and a bit of a skirmish and a gun went off and the shot was fatal to this is to Werner Schultz uh, on the 21st. And this particular event is important because whereas there had not been bloodshed prior to that and all these hundreds of people getting through is actually something, as, as we know, as we've talked about, that people like Nemeth and Pozhka were very excited about it. It was great that the curtain was dealing with these breaches. They were um, encouraging them. But the idea that uh, either border guards could go rogue or that accidents could happen and lead to international incidents uh, or activating Soviet presence in the region and so forth uh, was so exactly what Nimth was scared of. And so uh, you, were, you have this basically unsustainable position where they're telling uh, the world there's a law while the law enforcers are quite actively not enforcing the law, you know, these are people who are actually helping the, the refugees in certain contexts, not just not hurting them. Um, my favorite version of this is when the Hungarians would hold in their pockets uh, little folded pieces of paper with an arrow on it because they felt they couldn't say things to these Germans without getting in trouble from their superiors, but they can kind of show them where the border was, like show them where to head. These like little again, it's all it's all these levels of informality. It's informality upon informality. We're talking about law enforcers. This is law enforcement. I'm not even certain it's there anymore. They're not even certain what law they're enforcing, which leads to huge uh, issues within the ranks. You have lots of stories of people fearing their commanders. The commander might be more hardline than they were, or so forth. And so they're all making these little tiny moral judgments all the time. Should I help the refugees? Should I help them explicitly or implicitly? If I want to help them, how do I help them? How do I help them in a way that avoids my own capture? So little things like not saying anything but pointing in a direction is comes commonplace. This is exactly what Nemeth is worried about. And so it's within uh, a few weeks of the picnic that on September 11th, at the crack of midnight, uh, Nemeth issues an order to open the border. 
And then we really do have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of East Germans leaving freely across the border. And then, as we well know, within two months, the Berlin Wall falls and everything's over. Because, well, not over, but I mean, everything in terms of, of travel restriction uh, changes. Because one of the profound lessons in the book is that once you open up the Iron Curtain, the whole idea of the Berlin Wall falls apart. And this gets back to that initial insight of Nemeth, and also gets back to what, even even though it was absurd, was so powerful about the ideas of Fedens and Maria, um, which is that you you don't you really can see, you really can trace a through line from how an institution like the Berlin Wall, which we're not talking at all about East Germany in this discussion, we haven't really talked about. It. There were lots of reasons East Germany was falling apart, but the simple institution of what the wall was, they completely lost its foundation. In a matter of weeks, I mean, when you spoke to Nemeth, was he expecting things to move this quickly, or did he think this was going to be over a longer time period? No, and in fact, Nemeth was terrified at how quickly it was moving, because uh, Nemeth realized very quickly. In fact, he again throughout this, he's I mean, he's very aware of what he's doing. He knows how radical this stuff is, but he feels he's let the genie out of the bottle, and you. Uh, he had wanted a much slower, more measured reform. And, uh, no, it was spiraling out of control. And this becomes clear less in the events surrounding the September 11th opening and more as we get towards October, November, and December of that year when the Berlin Wall falls and so forth. And Hungary very rapidly starts to move towards a democratic future when Nemeth, in fact, really strongly wants to step on the brakes. And say this is this, this is not sustainable. We can't like we want multi-party democracy. We want liberal reform. We want all these things, but they can't happen in two months. And by the time he tries to step on the brakes, it's just it's too late. I mean, the, the within three months, by March, there's already elections. Nemeth is out of power. The Democrats are in power, and everything that Nemeth was scared of comes to pass, which is that they don't have a newly reformulated economy. You're going to have all the problems that I think probably a lot of your listeners know about the 90s. And uh, it's not just transition, it's privatization and the ways in which uh, state firms were, were sold off. And, you know, this is getting a little bit out of the remit of the book. I talk about it a little bit at the end. But all of it is something Nemeth saw. And all of it is something that Nemeth uh, uh, would have done whatever he could to have slowed. Um, but at this point, you know, the, the pick your metaphor, you know, the cat was out of the bag. Or, Whatever the horse is out of the farm. Yeah, and he's probably he's still got the the taint of being part of the party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so Nemeth is, becomes this sort of tragic figure to me, and which is part of why it's so profound to talk to him, and part of why he is the kind of you know he's the kind of person that makes sense of oral history, right? It's easy to say it's great to talk about you know the East German refugees that in a way are nameless, no one knows these people, they're unfamous, they're just average people. Part of what all history does is it reclaims stories you'd otherwise lose. But the other thing it does is it takes people who uh, are familiar names, at least in some sense, and gives a depth to their positionality that is outside of the strict uh, factuality of history, the, the, the dates and names and so forth. And Nemeth represents that because Nemeth, in a way, is the hero of a story that's that's not of his making, right? Like he doesn't want to be the person he becomes and is put in a position he's deeply uncomfortable with and ultimately gets vilified, right? He's the communist. The last communist prime minister of Hungary is ultimately a communist. And as they move towards a democratic future, what can he be but the the bad guy in that very simple Manichaean telling, which again, it's not, you know, we in the West are famous for these tellings. We, we know. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I grew up in 1980s USA, where the, the good and the bad, the, the liberal and the communist, the free and the unfree, I mean, it was all binaries. And Hungary never made sense of any of this. The whole way we began this conversation, Hungary never fit this model. And Nemeth, in particular, doesn't fit the model. So he becomes a tragic figure. He becomes the one for whom uh, the change ultimately, you know, he's the one left behind by this change. And uh, he gets vilified, and ultimately the systems that he predicted crash in the way he predicted. And uh, that's kind of sad, because 
at least you know in the in the in the way you'd you'd hope there'd be some kind of redemption and i and I certainly hope that uh uh one of the positive aspects of the book is people will see a bit of who he was as a as a person right that's part of what uh you can do in this kind of book because you really as a reader i hope meet him right um and you get a sense of how difficult his positionality is because ultimately he ends up in the same liminal place as Gorbachev. He's towing this incredibly fine line between wanting a reform and realizing the reform that he wants will ultimately. You spend a, a lot of time with him. You do get a really good in, insight in, into, or as good an insight as you, as you can get in, into the man himself. Um, how is the picnic viewed in Hungary today? Is it celebrated? Yeah, hugely. Uh, but uh, politically. So you have in Hungary, like in a lot of states, but I mean, certainly in a quite extreme form in Hungary, a very polarized political system where you have the old left who grow out of the communist tradition, notably through the man Horn, who was the um, foreign minister who cut the wire on in June 89. There's a lineage of the left that maintains and has become in a way center left or, you know, so- socialist or social democratic or so forth. And then you have the right that every year becomes more nationalistic and more in line with a kind of xenophobic populism that's quite common in Europe as well. And of course, these two poles, there really isn't much of a center in Hungary, these two poles uh, claim, in a way, their, their lineage, their origins from the same moment, right? So the Horn lineage are the reformers in government, and the Orban lineage are the reformers outside of government. The, the revolutionaries in the streets. And uh, people who only passively follow Hungarian politics or even European politics find it shocking that Orban, this man we now take to be this staunch right wing figure, has this revolutionary past. But actually, he does, right? And he emerges from the same moment and has carved out a political space for himself, as did Horn. These are both classic political operatives in a way that they're both, um, uh, as one, one of the more intelligent commentators that I interviewed for this book, a guy by the name of Oplatka, who unfortunately passed away um, two years ago, had a brilliant line about Horn, but it applies to Orban as well, which is that you know these people really are politicians, which is that if you ask for what they stand for, they stand for themselves. And uh, the, both of these people have carved out a legacy of 89, and the border opening is is central. I mean, this is part of uh, the Hungarian legacy of the whole Cold War, is the opening of this border. So 89 is celebrated differently. The picnic has become a cause celebrated of the right of Orban, because he it was organized by the opposition, right? And so Orban, even though he wasn't the opposition figure, it wasn't Fidesz, it was the MDF. Um, but it's that lineage, the lineage of the opposition in Hungary claims the picnic. You know, this is what happens with power. You can tell the story as you want. I mean, we know that, that, you know, history is told by the victors and so forth. This is just that we're now in an area in which Orban is reimagining history in a way that fits his image. Even, even as I say that, one can't diminish his real role in it, right? I don't, I don't. In fact, I think that one of the great take homes of this for me, again, as someone that did not come out of this with either a Cold War or even a Hungarian history background is that it's also shocking to me that this is where Orban came from. And one of the things that's interesting now when I listen to uh, European news and the way that you know, the, the EU in particular, Brussels in particular, vilifies Orban, for full disclaimer, I live in Europe, I live in, in Amsterdam. It's very normal to encounter people that say things like, what is wrong with Hungarians? They've lost their minds for voting for, for Orban. One of the take-homes of the book is, well, okay, there's a lot of ideological disagreement you might have with Orban, but you have to understand what he signifies in this country. And you can't take people out of the legacy, the lineage, the history in which they, in a way, are packaged as an, as an idiom um, locally. So, so Orban, in a way, is, un, is difficult to understand for us in the West. All we encounter is his new xenophobia, his building of walls, and so forth. The question then is to say, well, there are the two faces of Orban. Face one is wall builder, anti-migrant. Face two is old revolutionary, uh, the man that, you know, said Soviets get out. 
rather than just talking about how discordant they are and, and vilifying Hungary or, uh, or about ourselves, the more interesting question is to bridge them, is to ask, how did we get there? Not just in the big sense we all care about, how did we get from the fall of the Berlin Wall to our new era building walls? This is the question that I've basically spent my career trying to answer, right? This is kind of where I come from. Uh, but in the specific case, how do we get from an Orban that tears down a wall to an Orban that builds up a wall? And the answer has a lot to do with the different ways people understood uh, the big ideas of the time, things like freedom, right? There's a way that we in the West saw all these, these activists as being like us, right? The opposition, these students, they all looked great. They were talking about freedom and democracy, and they wanted all the things that we had. They wanted you know, free markets, etc. And yet freedom is more complicated than that. And a lot of what's interesting about going back in time and understanding what people like Orban were really saying, their freedom was much more about something like self-determination. It really was Soviets out. And so once you repackage the calls for freedom in a sovereigntist language, not a liberal language, it makes total sense why the first threat Orban would face was the Soviets to sovereignty, to Hungarian sovereignty. And the new threat Orban faces to the same sovereignty, in his view, is the migrant. I don't think that's inconsistent at all. I might not like it, right? I might not share the ideological prior, but it's a consistent ideological prior. And so, you know, and this goes back to the merit of oral history, the po point of understanding, not just what happened historically, but what people thought at the time, what things like freedom meant to them. Part of what's so brilliant about talking to all these Hungarian activists is being able to start, let's say, to parse these different conceptions of freedom embedded in their calls in the 80s, and then take that lineage to the present, not form-fit it to our own conception, which in this case doesn't fit at all. The book is called The Picnic, An Escape to Freedom and the Collapse of the Iron Curtain by Matthew Longo, and it's published by Bodley Head. Please use the links in the episode notes to buy the book and help support the podcast. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.